well, the very warmest of welcomes to this week's podcast. This Sunday is Bible Sunday, where we celebrate the fact that God is not a silent God, but a God who communicates, a God who wants us to understand who he is and who we are as well, and the fact that he has created us in order to have a personal relationship with him. The Bible's a little bit like a library. It's made up of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New, written over a period of about one and a half thousand years. What is unique about the scriptures, though, is that although they were written by a variety of human beings, they all ultimately have one author, in that they were all inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they did, so that ultimately the Bible is a revelation of God's mind to us. And in a sense, the Bible is there to open our eyes so that we might see the world in which we live clearly. Today, our scripture focuses on a healing of a blind man called Bartimaeus. But there's a lot more going on than just the physical healing of a pair of eyes. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who speaks, a God who communicates. And Lord, you have spoken through your written word and also, of course, through the living word, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray today that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you might open our ears to hear and open our spiritual eyes to see all the riches that are in your written word. And Lord, in the Gospels, we have the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples. And together we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This year, the church lectionary has been taking us through the Gospel of Mark, which is a fast-paced account of Jesus' life, ministry, death and resurrection. We have come to the end of chapter 10, and Jesus is in the final few weeks of his earthly ministry. He's left the northern environment of Galilee and travelled all the way down the east of Jordan, down to a region called Perea, and today sees him travelling from there to the town of Jericho. This will be a stopping over point on the way to his ultimate destination, which is of course Jerusalem. Jericho, along with Damascus in Syria, are thought to be the two longest inhabited cities in the entire world. We remember the old story about the walls of Jericho coming tumbling down that we read in the Old Testament. The town of Jericho in Jesus' day lay about a mile south of that original settlement, and it was built by Herod the Great. The modern town of Jericho incorporates both sites. One of the reasons for its longevity, though, is its strategic position in the middle of the Judean plain. It had natural springs and was an oasis in a very arid part of the world. It's about 17 miles east of Jerusalem, but about 3,500 feet lower down, about 800 feet below sea level. Hence, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus talks about a man travelling down on the road to Jericho, and it controlled both north and south, east and west trade routes, hence its commercial importance. We must remember that at this time in Jesus' ministry, his focus is on preparing his disciples for what is going to lie ahead when they pick up their own ministries in preaching the gospel. They're in the process of learning some very valuable lessons. They have at last come to understand who Jesus truly is, namely the Messiah. Jesus again and again comes back to the issue that to fulfil his role as a Messiah, he was going to have to tread a path of great suffering. The disciples find this very difficult to take on board. They've confessed the person, but are very confused by the plan. One of the key issues that Jesus covers is the radical nature of being a true disciple, that it was not going to be an easy road. It was going to be one of self-denial and possibly suffering as well. What's more, it's clear from Jesus' teaching that this radical form of discipleship is the only form that he views as being legitimate. And it's characterised by radical love, a love that doesn't cause another to stumble. And also radical moral purity as well, a life where personal sin is taken very seriously indeed. There is nothing haphazard in the scriptures, and at this part of Mark's Gospel, we find a series of cameos which are designed to show what the qualifications for true discipleship might be. 
we started off with the rich young ruler, who on the surface seemed to have all the qualities necessary to become a true follower of Jesus. And yet, he fails, even though he comes to the right person, namely Jesus. And also, he comes with the right attitude, one of humility. He kneels at Jesus' feet. And he also comes with the right question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what must I do to be saved? It's quite clear from his urgency that he is in a place of faith. He believes that Jesus truly does have the answers for him, which of course he does, but they're not quite as he imagined that they would be. We saw that there was a missing key in his profession, and that was the key of repentance. He thought he was a good person, and probably was, by the standards of his day. But Jesus reminds us that when we stand before God, our goodness is not evaluated in comparison with other people, but with God's infinite goodness. And when our goodness is compared to that standard, none of us are ultimately good. This is an issue that he hadn't grasped. He thought that he had kept the Ten Commandments since his youth. But Jesus shows him that that is far from the case and he does so by showing him that he has not kept the first and most important of all the commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus lovingly shows him that in fact his very wealth and possessions were becoming an obstacle between himself and God. He had turned them into an idol. And when Jesus gave him the choice of keeping his idol or becoming one of his true disciples, the rich young man failed the test. And what's more, Jesus allowed him to go. The young man couldn't have discipleship as an add-on to what he already had. It was an either-or. Jesus calls us to a total commitment, not a partial one. Well, this completely astounded the disciples, and they asked the question, well then, who can be saved? And of course, Jesus reminds them that what is impossible for human beings is possible for God. We then come to the point where Jesus starts to challenge his disciples about their attitude to their own discipleship. Peter reveals his what's-in-it-for-me attitude by saying to Jesus, well, look, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus reassures them that they will get their true reward. But ultimately, the disciples are still locked into a mindset where personal status is very important for them. They argue about who's going to be the greatest of them. And they even do this when it gets to the Last Supper. They have much to learn. They haven't grasped that there are two ways to greatness. There's the human way, and then there's God's way. The human way is the path of self-promotion. And the Bible describes this as carnal or worldly. It certainly seems to work in this world, but it doesn't work at all in the kingdom of God. God's way is the path of self-denial. It's referred to as being heavenly or Christ-like. And it works in the kingdom of God. Jesus talks them and demonstrates them the greatness of service. And although he is ultimately Lord of all, he lives a sacrificial life and says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the counterintuitive lesson that the disciples need to learn is that the way up is actually down. So we've had an example of failed discipleship of poor attitude in our discipleship, but now we're going to come to two characters who pass the test of discipleship. Both live in Jericho, but they're very different from one another. The first character is a man called Zacchaeus. He was a hated tax collector, a Jew who worked for the Romans. We read about his story in the Gospel of Luke. Like the young ruler, he was rich. But unlike him, he repents and renounces the idolatry of wealth by giving away half of what he had to the poor and also seeks to restore fourfold what he had unfairly gained by extortion. So his story is characterised by repentance and restitution. The Jericho incident recorded by Mark, though, is of the healing of blind Bartimaeus. It should be remembered that in the culture of the day, if you were blind, it was taken that you had been cursed by God, that either you or your parents had done something awfully wrong, and this was your punishment. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, refutes this as faulty thinking. 
Well, let's turn to our reading for today, which is Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And Mike's going to kindly read this for us now. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These two accounts of Zacchaeus and blind Bartimaeus form the last two acts of mercy in Jesus' ministry that we know of. Luke chooses to tell us of Zacchaeus and Mark chooses to tell us about blind Bartimaeus. Ultimately, they are both about becoming disciples of Jesus. Both Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus are outcasts in terms of Jewish society. One because of his collusion with the Roman oppressors, and in the case of Bartimaeus, because they viewed him cursed by God with blindness. They were both viewed as the lowest of the low. It is really difficult living with total blindness even today with all our technological advances. But in the case of Bartimaeus, it meant that he was completely destitute, completely dependent upon the charity of others to supply him with the necessities of the day. Although Bartimaeus is at the bottom of the order of society, he does appear to have some spiritual understanding, what we might call the theology of Bartimaeus. Firstly, he seems to understand who Jesus really is. He cries out, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Right throughout the scriptures, Son of David is a messianic title. Remember the angels on the night that Jesus was born, crying out to the shepherds on the hillside, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And in but a few days' time, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, the crowds will shout out, Hosanna to the Son of David, even though those cries will turn to crucify him by the end of the week. Bartimaeus, begging by the side of the busy Jericho road, will have heard rumours of this famous teacher, this Jesus of Nazareth, who did wonderful miracles of healing people. And the arrival of Jesus in his vicinity, on his road, was an opportunity that was too good to be missed. What's more, there's one miracle that we don't see in the Old Testament, which is ascribed to the coming Messiah, and that is the giving of sight to the blind. For example, the prophet Isaiah says this, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. There are several other similar quotations. So if anybody was going to be able to heal him, It was going to be Jesus, God's Messiah. As well as acknowledging Jesus as the son of David, Bartimaeus also cries out for mercy. Not reward or justice, but mercy. And this is a really important point. Bartimaeus is acknowledging that Jesus owes him nothing. And that as a sinner, he deserves nothing but God's judgment. He may even have viewed his own blindness as part of that judgment. Remember, a plea for God's mercy is a plea that God would refrain from giving us what we actually deserve. And writing hard on the heels of mercy is the implied request that God might be gracious towards him. Remember, grace is the unmerited favour of God. It's asking God to give us what we don't really deserve, what we haven't earned. Notice as well that he doesn't cry out once but does so persistently. He is absolutely determined to get Jesus' attention. The crowd regard him as a nuisance, as a distraction, and as it says, many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. He had no regard for public opinion. He had nothing to lose. There's a real lesson for us here as we seek God's help in times of trouble. And Jesus taught through his parable of the unjust judge, 
of the power of persistence. When we're truly desperate, God responds. And Lamarck said this, The reason help is such a great prayer is that God is the gift of desperation. When you're in despair, you're teachable. Jesus, of course, knows exactly what is wrong with Bartimaeus. Yet he engages him by asking him, What do you want me to do for you? In responding to Jesus, Bartimaeus addresses him as, well, my teacher, using the version that we've used today. But that doesn't really deliver the true import of the original language. He uses the term Rabboni, an Aramaic word, a word that is used only on one other occasion in the whole of the New Testament. Normally, when people responded to Jesus, they referred to him or called him Rabbi. But Rabboni has a greater depth to it. It implies a greater elevation of the person that you're talking to. It's really my teacher, uh, my lord, my master that is implied here. The other occasion is the response of Mary to the risen Jesus in the garden outside the empty tomb on the morning of the resurrection. Bartimaeus says, let me see again, which would imply that he hadn't been born blind, but had become blind at some time during his life. The paradox of blind Bartimaeus is that he has spiritual vision, although he is physically blind. He can see who Jesus is in the spiritual realm, although he physically cannot apprehend him. This is in contrast to many of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, who physically could see, but were spiritually blind. We can think of their response to the man who was born blind, who was healed by Jesus in John chapter 9. Right through that chapter, as they seek to refute what Jesus has done, they become more and more spiritually blind and obtuse. And by the end of the chapter, Jesus says this, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Well, before we leave Bartimaeus today, it should be noted that there is the suggestion here that Bartimaeus' healing was more than physical, but also had a spiritual aspect to it as well. The New Testament was originally written in Greek, and the word which is translated as has healed is sosokon, and the etymological root of this word is the Greek word sozo, from which we get saved. There's another clue that this healing was spiritual as well as physical. Many of the people who Jesus healed during his ministry went away rejoicing and got on with their normal lives. Not so with Bartimaeus. He immediately follows Jesus. He becomes one of Jesus' disciples. We think that Mark's Gospel was originally written for a mainly Gentile audience. Mark, when introducing Bartimaeus, then calls him son of Timaeus. And that is in fact a redundancy, because in the Hebrew, Bartimaeus literally does mean son of Timaeus. But what is interesting is that of all the miracles that Jesus did during his ministry, Bartimaeus is the only occasion where a name is given to the person being healed. And many commentators have wondered why this is so. The suggestion has been made that maybe Bartimaeus was quite a well-known figure in the New Testament church, somebody who the readers of Mark's Gospel might have heard about. So it's possible Bartimaeus followed Jesus all the way to Jerusalem, became part of the crowd on Palm Sunday, was in Jerusalem as Jesus was arrested and crucified. He may have been part of the group that heard about the resurrection on Easter Sunday. It would be nice to think of him gathered together with that group of about 150 in the upper room as they prayed and read the scriptures and waited for the coming of Pentecost and then became part of the Great Commission, spreading the good news of Jesus with the personal testimony of the power of God in his own life. Well, I suppose that is conjecture. But of all the people who Jesus dealt with in his earthly ministry, each one had a unique story of what happened to them after that, stories that we don't know about. But it's clear that whoever came into contact with Jesus was profoundly changed by the experience. And so to our prayers of intercession, and Mike's going to lead us in those today. Father, we live in a world of turmoil. Natural processes of fire and drought are amplified and made unpredictable by our consumption. 
we pray for the forthcoming climate conference, where nations are protecting their wealth, overseeing to the common good. We recognise the need for us to change and surrender our wealthy consumption of goods and energy. Still, the Covid pandemic runs its course. As we prepare to receive booster jabs, enable our government to supply those around the globe who are unvaccinated. We pray for the Church. We pray for integrity of the Church, lay and ordained. Give us a vision to fan the flames and proclaim the Gospel in postmodern ways. We pray for all of those who give of their time and effort to ensure the premises are safe and sound and to enable our worship. Those who brighten the chapel with flower arrangements. Those who greet us at the door and see to our well-being. For those who shoulder the responsibility of arranging organists and readers and preachers. For those who raise the leading notes of praise and worship, skilled with musical instruments and voices, we give you thanks and pray that you will encourage each of us. We pray for everybody who's sick in mind, body and spirit. We pray particularly today for those who have invisible diseases, those suffering dementia and Alzheimer's disease, for those who are chronically ill and terminally suffering, for all those where living is no more than barely existing. Come Holy Spirit, as we remember and name those in our families and our friends who are sick and ill, be with them, encourage them and uplift them. We pray for women, women who face prejudice and exploitation, who are trafficked for sex, who are vulnerable to assault, abuse and rape, those who know the grief and pains of miscarriage, for those who are passed over because they're just women. Father, give us eyes to see how to treat honourably all women that we come across in our lives. At the last, at the last the best is God is with us. You've accompanied our days and years. No matter where we've gone, whether trying to hide or draw near, you've been constantly present. Through the mercy of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, bring us confidence that our sins are forgiven, and that in parting this earth we will be in your presence in heaven, for you have prepared a place for us. We bring our prayers and petitions to your throne. May we be responsive to your reply. To the glory of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so to our final prayers. Heavenly Father, we know there's more than one sort of blindness. Father, we pray for those who are physically blind, and we know that when they enter your kingdom, Lord, they will see you perfectly. Father, I also pray for our spiritual blindness, Lord, where we do not see your truth, or where we close our eyes and don't wish to see it either. Lord, give us the grace of your healing touch that we might have true vision to sustain us in a difficult world. Lord, be the light in our darkness, and may the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon your soul this day and give you peace. Amen. We're having a half-term break next week, so there won't be a podcast, but we'll be back the week after that. So till then, every blessing to you. <laughs>